hello. Uh, my name is Wesley Dixon. I'm an attorney at the law firm of Gaston Crotty and today we're going to be talking about you know home building OBA and the home and owner's guide to what to do immediately post Hurricane Ian and a little bit thereafter. So just a little bit about me. Uh, I went to Stetson University, graduated in 2017 with a degree in public management, and then I went to Stetson Law School, graduated in 2020. And my whole life, I've lived in Fort Myers, so this is something that's really hit home. And unfortunately, my family was severely impacted as well. So, it, you know, it's especially a topic that hits close to home for me, and I'm sure a lot of us as well. So, I'm just going to pass it over, and we'll see. Turns. All right. Um, I'm Allison Freeman. I work at Constable Law with James. James and I have worked together for quite some time. We started out working on the defense side for an insurance company, and then um, James made his way over to the planet side and then him and I ran into each other one day at a wedding and I mentioned, hey, if you're, ever, if you're looking for some help, I would love to um, assist because I think we both had worked on that insurance side. It's definitely interesting to see it from the insurance side and see what happens to homeowners and business owners and then you kind of get that feel of, all right, I'd like to see if I could maybe flip, the, flip it around and do it for that side and maybe um, make an impact that way. So. Um, we've now been doing this for a couple of years now, I lost track, but um, been on this side being able to do cleanup work and we, um, I think it feels good to be able to help. I mean, Ian has been quite a disruptive event and I think it's a little scary right now. I think if you're paying attention watching what's possibly coming this week as well um, with this another storm out there. Um, and so, uh, you know, with, we're in the thick of it right now. So we're trying, it's nice being able to help people um, and maybe na help them navigate this process and assist with dealing with the insurance companies, which is a very, um, it's a process that if you don't have someone helping you, sometimes can be very, very difficult and confusing. And so I'm glad that we're able to help with that. Sounds good. Good evening, everybody. My name is James Constable. Um, I'm an attorney uh, like these two. And uh, my law practice uh, since even before law school uh, has always involved uh, property insurance. So I spent about five years uh, working for insurance companies, uh, starting off right after Hurricane Charlie and Wilma, kind of in the mid 2000s, uh, when we got hit with multiple hurricanes. And I did that and then in uh, 2012, switched sides. And so 100% of my law practice is representing policyholders, so homeowners and commercial building owners with property insurance claims. So uh, the root of our practice is really roof claims, hurricane claims, uh, and storm claims, and assisting policyholders through the process of, uh, you know, sometimes it's reporting the claim, sometimes it's overcoming a uh, claim that's been denied, uh, or dealing with a scenario where uh, there's been an acknowledgement of coverage, but there's a dispute as to what the uh, amount of law. Also, I've worked to get thousands of uh, residential homeowners insurance claims across the state. Um, and we also represent uh, corporate entities. Uh, we represent Hooters of America nationally with respect to their losses whenever there's a restaurant fire or some sort of a catastrophic loss. Uh, we represent a lot of hotels and uh, homeowners associations, condominium communities, uh, and that sort of thing. So uh, that is 100% of our practice and, and, and what we've done for about the last 15 years. All right, so just to get started, um, they are both incredibly knowledgeable about insurance. I, unfortunately, am not. So just for everyone out there, including myself, when it comes to homeowner's insurance, are there different types of homeowner's insurance policies? And if so, are there certain things that are covered under some but not others? Sure. So, I mean, in a, in a typical context of somebody owning a home, uh, you have what's called an HO3, or a homeowner's insurance policy. And uh, those policies, uh, by and large, provide coverage in the event of a windstorm. So, her uh, cause a loss in that policy. Those policies typically exclude flood. And so, um, uh, from, from Hurricane Ian, we've seen a lot of overlap. You've got windstorm damage, and then also, if you're anywhere near the coast or anywhere near some of these areas that have experienced localized flooding, uh, we've got flooding damage as well. So, there's optional coverage uh, through uh, the um, NFIP, which is a federal program which provides flood insurance. Uh, your typical homeowner's insurance policy provides coverage for damage to the building, okay? Uh, and then in addition to that, a typical homeowner's insurance policy provides coverage for other structures, uh, which might include fences or pool screens, 
uh, sheds or detached structures. Um, and then you've got uh, typical coverage for contents or personal property and uh, coverage for additional living expenses. So if you're displaced by the storm, that would fall under your windstorm coverage. Um, and, and, and like I said, the, the typical homeowner's insurance policy excludes flood. And so we've got these federal policies, largely federal. There are some exceptions where the private policies, but largely we've got federal policy dealing only with flood with, uh, with certain limitations. But that's the typical residential homeowner's insurance policy is a HO3. And then, um, you know, if somebody has rental properties, um, uh, that, that would be a dwelling policy. And the big distinction there is the dwelling policy usually doesn't provide coverage for contents. It usually doesn't provide coverage for um, uh, per, you know, personal property. There may be com coverage for uh, lost rent uh, if, it's a, if it's a rental property. So uh, but those are kind of the, the primary uh, policies and, and, and coverages that are in these policies. Now, in your experience, at least in Florida, do most homeowners insurance policies come with a wind coverage as well, or is that you know more of a unique thing they only find in a couple of the policies? Usually, I wind coverage separately. Usually, those are your dwelling or condo policies. I haven't seen on homeowners as much, um, but there's always important to look at your whole policy, obviously, because usually with hurricane coverage or windstorm coverage, you're going to have a separate deductible. Um, there's certain things that are going to apply separately just to that coverage versus just your normal property insurance coverage. Um, and so that comes into play. Usually it's a 10% deductible versus you may have like a thousand dollar deductible for other coverage, like 2,500. So I think sometimes people, you know, they see they have windstorm, they see they have hurricane, great, I'm covered. And then Further down your policy, you start to notice, oh, there's a 10% deductible for my hurricane or windstorm coverage, which is a pretty big chunk of money if you're dealing with certain policies versus, you know, 1,000 or 2,500. So, um, yeah, so it's usually in there. It's just there may be cert certain caveats to um, the deductible. All right, great. So a lot of us I know are coming back into Fort Myers, you know, this past month or these past couple of weeks, and a lot of us are seeing the damage for the first time. We're seeing our homes without walls, you know, they may be gutted already or they may, you know, be requiring that as the next step. So when you come and you're just overwhelmed with emotions, what's the one thing you would urge homeowners to do first? Take that first step. Breathe. <laughs> um, breathe uh, because, you know, there's a lot in place to help you with what's going on but um and then take photos is a big big thing because as you start to clean up and get rid of things and start to tear out walls and do whatever you need to do to start to make your place livable again or to take care of things it's very difficult to recreate what was already there and I think especially I know down here um people are laying things out on the street and you're not sure when it's going to get picked up and so you may assume oh that's going to be there for the insurance adjuster to see and then that may be the day that the trucks decide to finally get to your street or finally get to your property and then those items aren't available. And the insurance companies are going to want to see all those things, see what's been done. Um, I know, especially with flood versus wind, which I'll probably talk about more, but there's a, with the water and where it got to, there's usually a line, there's a point, and you can see that on a home or a property when you're there for that first time, you'll notice where it was, even if the water's gone, you'll start and understand the location is. Um, I think we have you could see the first level versus the second level. You would have never known that there was a storm on the second level almost. I mean, versus the first. But on the first level, it was, I mean, the splatter marks and the disarray that was left there from the storm storm surge. And this was during Hurricane Sally, but it was just night and day. And so without taking those photographs and being able to show that, it was very difficult for them to pinpoint where that line was and how high the water was because it's already gone at that point. So then you're guessing, the adjuster is guessing or not guessing, but giving your best effort. And so for you, it's important to be able to completely support your position, document, 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 um, because you're your best advocate, right? I mean, that's what we have a job for is to be advocates, but you have to be your own advocate first. And so that's why it's so important to take all those photographs and really make sure that you're pinpointing, writing down things, Especially there's some items that you may notice that are difficult to take photographs of. Make sure you maybe take a list of what you're seeing or what is there or what should have been there a lot of times because a lot of it may be washed away, but you know 
I have this picture or this artwork here, or I have this item here and I don't know where it is, but just start making those lists while it's fresher in your mind because as time goes on, it gets harder to remember what was there and not there. Right. Now, getting to what you said about the flood and the wind, uh, another consideration I know my parents had heard about this is, is there, is it true that there's kind of a war between the flood insurance adjusters and the wind where they'll try to point at each other and pin the blame on the other, or is that kind of a myth? Well, um, you know, I don't know that it's necessarily a war, but it's it's a job, right? So you go to these properties and it's not always crystal clear um, where the flood line is, or maybe you can see where the flood line is. And so the adjuster's job is to avoid overlapping coverages. So you walk into a, you know, even a room like we're sitting right now, and you know, if you've got the flood line up three feet, well, flood is on the hook for paying for flood up to three feet. And then you've got a windstorm carrier, and they're essentially responsible for the water that entered from the top down. Right, so we've got a, you know, we've got a combination of things from Hurricane Ian. We've got roofs that were damaged, and then we've got you know water that entered the dwelling through flood. It sort of involves two different insurance companies. So the wind adjuster's job is to determine what damage to that property that they're inspecting came from wind, came from the top down, and the flood adjuster's job is to determine what water came from the bottom up. So I mean, there can be a war. There's definitely disputes over it, but it's it's because we're coming in after the fact, you know, days, weeks, or sometimes even months after the hurricane hit and trying to decipher, well, how much of this damage was from wind and how much of this damage is, is from flood. And it tends to be very subjective. You know, we've walked through a lot of these properties. It's very difficult to pinpoint it because the reality is, you know, the water coming from the top down affects the drywall in the bottom three feet. You know, the flood water driving also contribute towards that. And so you've got adjusters, from all over the country uh, coming on behalf of these insurance companies, right? A lot of guys from out of state, and they're here, and we need them to be here because, you know, the insurance companies and house adjusters can't keep up with the amount of money with claims. But th those two adjusters from different states, different parts of the country, with totally different training and backgrounds, are trying to come up with a concerted or unified position of this is covered by flood, and this is covered by so what tends without what what tends to happen uh, is the windstorm insurance company um, tends to point to flood uh, or be more apt to point to flood uh, because they want to pay for that, right? So um, you know, likewise, you might see the flood adjuster pushing back and saying, "No, that, that's from windstorm." So you've got overlapping coverages. You know, not all insurance companies are bad, not all, you know, flood and wind adjusters are, you know, at war or even disagreeing, but it's just such a subjective analysis to go into these properties and, and make the determination of what's covered by wind and what's covered by flood. It can be a big, you know, burden, and there's certainly an uh, opportunity for there to be points of contention. And from the, the policyholder standpoint or the homeowner standpoint, um, if the damage we're looking at is, is covered by flood, well, these flood policies have a lot of limitations. You know, there's... Um, very specific things that flood covers and doesn't cover versus, you know, typical homeowners insurance policy that a lot more that restores pre loss condition, storm coverage is a lot of cost to its pre loss condition. So if that damage is caused by wind, it's typically going to be more beneficial for the policy or for the homeowner than if the damage is caused by a flood. And so that, that creates some opportunity for advocacy when it's hard to pick out is it wind or is it flood? or you've got two different factors contributing towards the same damage. That's great, that leads right into the next question. So when it comes to you know having an advocate on your side, when is the right time or is there a right time to bring out a professional such as a public adjuster or an attorney? Should you wait you know, right as soon as it happens or is it better to wait for a bit? You know, I, I, think, um, I, think everybody's trying to, I think everybody's trying to do the right thing as a policy holder, homeowner, trying to figure out. There's a lot of people in town, right? Contractors knocking on the door every day, uh, you know, getting warned about assignment benefits, insurance company saying, hey, don't sign anything. So, you know, it's tough. And at the end of the day, you don't want to give up money that you're entitled to to a third party if you don't have to. Um, so I think there's there's nothing wrong with waiting until the insurance company comes out, writes a check, sends a letter and says, hey, here's how much we're paying before hiring an advocate. And there's a lot of people that, that do that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I, I don't. Uh, I, I don't try to push somebody, hey, you need to hire somebody right away necessarily. But that can be the right decision for a lot of folks. I mean, we we 
you know, work for a lot of property managers and, you know, individual building owners as well, that either don't have the time to, to deal with it, um, are concerned that they lack the expertise to deal with the claim on their own, or just want to know that they've got a professional working for them, you know, from the very beginning. So I don't necessarily think there's a right or wrong answer. Um, and I think anybody that tries to make you feel like, hey, you have to sign this or you have to hire me right now, you know, I would, I would meet but um, my, my for everybody. At some point, my is at some point you get a check in the mail from your insurance company and a letter saying this is what we're paying you for your loss. That's the point in time to talk to somebody and get a second opinion because that letter, that check are based on the recommendations of an adjuster that was hired by the insurance company. And that person was hired by the insurance company probably for the 10,000th time in the last five years, right? That this, it's the same companies working for the insurance companies over and over and over again. And just like anything, you know, there are, you know, leanings in favor of the insurance company on some of these subjective calls. So, you know, I, I don't know that we've seen, but a few claims uh, out of thousands where we weren't able to add some sort of value at some point, you know, there was some coverage that was overlooked or some portion of damage that wasn't included in the adjuster's estimate or probably should have been. So, um, at some point, you want to have somebody giving you a second opinion. Go out to the property and write a, a competing estimate or a, a real-world estimate so that you know what the repair costs are going to be and, and can advocate for that. But I don't think there's anything wrong with, especially somebody that feels sophisticated or understands what's in the insurance policy to, to make those arguments. I would just say uh, be very skeptical when the insurance company says, okay, great, we're going to mail you a check, but you've got to sign this release for the settlement agreement. The insurance companies are obligated to pay you what they think they owe you without that being conditioned on a release. When the insurance comes out, whether it's flood or wind, I rarely see this with flood, but I am seeing this with wind, especially more often now. The insurance company comes out, they do their inspection, they write their estimate. They owe you what their estimate, their adjuster said they owe you. They have to write you that check. They can't call you and say, hey, here's what our estimate is. Now, if you just sign this settlement agreement and release, we'll mail you the check. But I am seeing some insurance companies do that. They can't. They have to pay you the check. They think they owe you. It's called an undisputed. So you get the undisputed, and at that point, then you hire an advocate. I really think it's probably in the best interest of most uh, of most homeowners. Now, that kind of gets to another good point. People are very wary because people may get, you know, mail from contractors, from public adjusters wanting to do their business. What advice do you have for anybody who's really weary who may want the help but maybe hesitant to accept the first you can look up all licenses so make sure you do whoever's knocking on your door ask them for anything take it in go do your research talk to your neighbors talk to your friends talk to other people who are using them you'll see the trucks all over the place you can see the work that they're doing People will notice, you know, oh, I watched my neighbor's roof get put up way too quickly, probably quicker than it should have been or whatever. So then you start to see who you should stay away from. But yeah, you can always check your licenses. You can always ask them any questions that you want. You shouldn't have to sign anything without asking all the questions that you need and doing the research that you want on these people so you can vet them and decide that you're comfortable with them. Um, they're going to want your business right now. I mean, that's, there's see trucks in the parking lot here. I'm sure they want business. So they're going to answer your questions if they won't and they don't make you feel comfortable you know that's a big red flag not to use a company like that i used to tell people all the time like especially on roofs and things i wouldn't you know not i wouldn't go with the first ever i also don't say i'm gonna go with the most expensive just because it's most expensive it's i'm gonna have three people come out give me bids take the numbers what am i comfortable with um get an idea of that same thing with you know just talking to people and knowing that you feel comfortable with who that who is going to be helping you because especially the claims process isn't really quick sometimes. And so you're gonna, you know, if you if you hire us, you're talking to us quite a bit, you are stuck with us for some time. So we want you to like us. We wanna, you know, we want it to be a good good um, relationship because we are advocating on your behalf. We'll be helping you answer some questions on behalf of the insurance company. So you wanna know that who you're working with is someone that makes you feel comfortable and that you're happy to maybe be dealing with them for six months, maybe a year, maybe hopefully shorter than that, but um, just making sure you understand who that person is and then yeah the licenses are a big thing making sure you've asked about it do they have their own insurance that kind of stuff um if they're going to be on your property for a long time ask you can ask questions like do you bring a porta potty it may sound really silly but some people are like i do not want people coming in and using my one working 
all those and I get it. so you can ask all those questions and they should be able to tell you how they operate. One uh one thing I wanted to touch on is especially in pandemic or not pandemic, but you know, post hurricane situations like this, you have a lot of people coming from out of state to help. Is there any considerations you would give versus hiring someone who maybe lets is in the state versus say a neighboring state like Georgia or Alabama? I still check on them, but I mean I don't think it has to be a Florida company, but I also feel like Florida companies know Florida and know our materials, know um, especially building codes down here. We we're just talking about how the building codes have changed in response to hurricanes. And if you notice when you drive around, you will notice that certain structures fared better at the end than others. And if you can tell that those structures have certain materials in place likely based on when they're built. And so I think having companies that are local, or at least they can be a company that maybe located elsewhere, but make sure they do Florida work and they've done Florida work and built Florida homes and built Florida property so that they know how to build here, I guess. I thought. Yeah, for me, I think the answer is uh, it's segmented, segmented depending on the, the work that's being done. So if we're talking about emergency services and dry out, you know, I walk into the house and the drywall's wet and the flooring's wet, which hopefully we're past now, you know, around day 40 after the storm. But over the last month, there's been a lot of wet materials that have been discarded. Unfortunately, next week, you might be that same problem. Across the state later this week, it's going to bring a lot of rain. So, you know, the context of somebody doing dry out, where the scope of work is limited to drywall, removing wet flooring materials and getting out of the house, whether they're in state or out of state, I'm not super concerned with. But, you know, if we're talking about who's putting my roof back on my house, I want a local guy because, you know, six months from now, when my roof starts leaking, I have some sort of problem. I want a local guy that's going to come out and fix it. He's going to come out and fix it because he lives four miles from my house and he's advertising in town. And I've got to be able to hold him accountable. Too many times I see out of state roofers uh, come in after a hurricane like this. And, you know, they've got the materials and they've got the labor crew. Maybe they can do a good job because they know roofing. Um, and maybe they have learned the Florida building code so they know the process that needs to be done. But at the end of the day, who are you going to call when there's an issue with that roof later on down the line? And hopefully, if you're having a roof installed, you know, you're getting some sort of a warranty. So, together. Uh, so when it comes to putting those back, uh, you know, reinstalling drywall and paint, you know, finishings, that's the sort of thing where I, I personally, I want a local guy. I want somebody from this area uh, that, that's going to be accountable. And uh, I've been very, very skeptical of out of state companies that are down here because. You know, at any point in time, it might be more profitable for them to pick up and move out of town. And of course, I've just seen a lot of folks that are kind of left with a half completed project and uh, then they call for the contractor pulled out. And it's really hard, especially right now with escalating construction costs and, uh, you know, some of the inflationary pressures that we're all facing right now. If you get halfway through a construction project and that comes to a halt and you've got to find a new contractor, that can oftentimes result in additional costs. And those additional costs might not be covered by insurance because the Insurance policy uh, created coverage for restoring loss to pre loss condition. They've already paid that, just having it wasted away by a bad contractor. So that's important to avoid. Yeah. Touching on roofs while we're at it, there's a, I don't know if it's a wives' tale, but there's a rumor out there that Florida will not insure a roof that's over 10 years old. Is that true? I know that's what I was raised hearing. No, 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 there's no, there's no, no. There was some proposed legislation last year. Uh, that was going to create a payment schedule, a, fee, uh, a reimbursement schedule, if you will, if you had roof damage. So if the Florida legislator passed this this bill that was that was circulated, if your roof was 10 years old or more, if a hurricane hit, you'd only be getting 50% uh, of the replacement cost, uh, which would really be terrible. Fortunately, that bill did not get passed. So that was, you know, if you Google it, you'll see some news articles talking about the proposed legislation, and it was not passed. If you got insurance on your roof, it's covered. It's covered whether your roof is seven years old or 17 years old. That replacement cost in the majority of these policies, um, irrespective of age. I know some people have been really worried because there are a lot of policies that got canceled or were being canceled. Um, and so they may have received a cancellation letter. And so they're not sure, do I not have insurance? What I contact? The date of loss is what matters. So whoever your insurance company was on that date of loss, you are covered. Also, the state has passed that they cannot cancel you for now, right now, um, during this process and then 90 days after. So 
as far as those policies that may have been you were told they were going to be canceled or non-renewed, those are still in place. And so people have called and said, oh my gosh, I got this letter saying it was being canceled on this and this day. I have no insurance. Well, yes, you do. You have insurance in place. Contact that insurance company. Tell them about your damage. And so I'm I'm hoping that there are a lot, a lot of people who are losing valid claims for fear that they just don't have insurance because they got these letters in the mail pre-in and they don't realize that that coverage is still in existence until that time. And now it's that time has also been extended because of the state of Florida and what they passed. So I just have been trying to tell people that because I think people are just really worried. They just, they got a cancellation letter. They freaked out about it before the storm thought, okay, I'll get coverage later. And then this storm hit and it wasn't on the top of their mind. So, yeah. Um, so for people in Florida who maybe have not had their home touched at all, or maybe they suffered a couple of fallen trees, would you still recommend they reach out to insurance, even though they might not have a very large claim to file? I guess like the difference between no claim or a small claim, I guess, are different things. Yeah. In my mind. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, you don't want to call on a frivolous claim. You don't want to call on a claim unnecessarily. Uh, if it's just trees that were down, there's probably, you know, some limitations in the policy, uh, some sublimits in the policy. So uh, coverage would be awfully limited. I would say that, you know, this storm was of a magnitude, particularly in Charlotte County and Lee County and in the surrounding area. I would think anybody that's in this room and here locally, you know, your house sustained, you know, 140, 150 mile an hour winds for an extended period of time. Um, and, and that does damage uh, properties. And one thing that we see is a latent defect or latent damages from the roof. What I mean by that is the storm hits and um, and, and, it, and it appears the roof is fine because from the street, it doesn't look like there's any missing shingles or any tiles, or it looks like the metal's still intact. And uh, we're kind of in a dry period right now, absent this, you know, uh, tropical depression. So we don't have a lot of rain. Uh, but what, in our experience, what happened is as the months go by, especially once we get into that spring summertime, uh, with the rainstorms, now all of a sudden the roof that wasn't leaking over the last, you know, five, seven, ten years, whatever. Now we come into next spring when we get into this heavy rain season, or even later this week with what's expected to be a lot of heavy rain, and we see the roof that we thought that was okay leaking. And even though it wasn't super obvious right after the storm that the roof was were lifted and then set back in place, or tiles that were lifted and then set back in place, but they've been debonded, or their water shedding ability isn't what it was before the storm. So that kind of speaks to a more thorough inspection. Um, uh, and, and, and a lot of homeowners, you know, for good reason, are not walking around on their roofs, or building owners are not walking around on the roofs after the storm. We probably shouldn't be. Um, and even if we were, we might not know what to look for. But having somebody do those damaging inspections, especially if you see signs of interior leaks, you know, ceiling stains. So what I would say is if you're not sure, pay really, really close attention looking for interior ceiling stains or new watermarks um, after a new rainstorm. Because Going back to the last question about the roofs that are 10 years old or more, what we've seen uh, over the last 12, 18 months is our insurance premiums are going up, right? And what we're seeing is an increase in the amount of underwriting that's going into the policies, which is why a lot of policies are being canceled or not renewed. And we're seeing citizens grow because of right? the state-run entity citizens. And so the, insure, the private insurance companies are staying in Florida are getting a lot more strict about the condition of your roof. And so if your roof is more than 10 years old or shows signs of wear and tear aging, the insurance companies are getting more picky about whether they wanna renew your policy next year. And so as those renewals come up, which are at different times of the year, depending on when you, when you first took out your policy, if the insurance companies being real picky and they say, you know what, I, I don't wanna insure this anymore because this looks like an old roof or we knew it just went through Earth, Ian, um, you might be you know, losing your insurance and not know a way to get new insurance is to put a new roof on it. And so if there's damage can be tied to Hurricane Ian, of course, you want to make sure you kindly present the claim to your insurance company because once that policy is canceled, it's hard to go back to that carrier that was in place in Ian. So hypothetically, my policy gets canceled in January because the insurance company comes back out. I didn't report a claim from Ian, but it, here's January 2023. Underwriters come out. He says, you know, this roof looks a little past its prime. We're not going to insure you anymore. Now you're faced with paying out of pocket to replace this roof. Never reported a claim. Kind of hard to go back to the original insurance company. So 
if you're on the fence, I tend to say, hey, you know, report the damage, you know, at least get an inspection done um, so that you can see what's what's there and what's not there. Absolutely. I know when the hurricane first hit, everyone on Facebook, my parents were all abuzz with these 25% rules and these 50% rules. Are those the same? Are they different? Can you touch on those rules a bit and how they might impact Florida homeowners? Sure. I'll jump in on 25%. I'll now uh, jump in on 50% since that's a can of worms. Um, Mine's an easy one. So, uh, so in construction in Florida, uh, we got the Florida building code. Right? Florida building code tells us says if any um if any repairing or replacing or upgrading if that repair or the replacement is going to exceed 25 percent of um of that of the value of that uh component then you've got to bring it up to current code so the easiest example is I've got a house and it's got four windows in it, right? Easy math, four windows. If I'm only replacing one window, I'm at that 25% threshold, right? So, you know, if if I if I'm at or exceeding 25% of the windows in my house, then I've got I've got to upgrade all my windows. So, a uh, hurricane came and uh, it, it blew out and whatever, it blew out two out of six windows. I can't just replace those two windows that were damaged. I now because it damaged two out of six of my windows, I now have to bring all my windows up to current. Right, because more than 25% of my windows have been damaged. Same goes for the roof. 25% or more of the roof is brought up to code, which is a new roof it's damaged. It's the current is a same for electrical. Anything in construction, if it's 25% or more of the value of that component, has got to be brought up to current code. And that's that's the Florida building code trying to say, hey, don't keep patching things. You know, if you're upgrading your electrical panel. Anything that's 25% more than the value that component got to be brought to current code. It allows us to make minor repairs, but anything above being a minor repair has to be brought to current code. The windows and roofs are the two most common examples that we, we see that in. And now I'll to Allie for the 50% <laughs> rule. There's a big can of worms down here because it all talk, deals with flood and uh, whether a building can actually be repaired or uh, has to be uh, brought to compliance with the current floor building code. Right, so the 50% rule, uh, James mentioned earlier how the flood insurance is through NFIP. Um, and so that's a federal program. So under that program, what they require is that if your property will require 50% of its value or what the repairs that are being done to it exceed improvement to the building that is equal to or exceeds 50% of its value, then you have to bring it up to current code. So you have to with regards to a lot of these properties that we're seeing, and you know, you've got these buildings that were built, and it's certain they, um, I guess it's those properties that were in existence in 1984 after, right? After 1984. Sorry. So if you are one of those properties, you've been probably up to this date, you've been fine. And then if you had damage from Ian and you have to fix it, repair it, and you start to hit that 50% of your value, then you have to bring it to current code, which means for a lot of these properties, having to, if you're in zone A, you know, lifting the structure, bringing it up, um, changing out all the windows that he was talking about to make sure that they reach that new building code. So this has always been a big issue for, um, especially homeowners, more so than building owners, because you know these properties have been there forever, especially on Fort Myers Beach. I know a lot of those properties have been there for a very long time. Um, I used to live down here. I'm very familiar with that area. I've watched a lot of people talk on Facebook about this. The numbers looking up the values of their property and realizing that 50 percent is getting hit really 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 quickly so they go from being able to just fix what's there and take their house and rebuild it to having to now meet all these codes for a zone a building or property and having to lift the structure and um you know, get these windows and change out how the roof structure is and so it becomes a very expensive process um, and a lot of them are probably looking at sadly Bulldozing and almost restarting versus being able to actually fix the property at that point when you hit that 50%. So, a lot of them I've seen kind of trying to figure out how do we get to. Go over. Um, it's a difficult thing when you've got to get, um, you know walls taken out and mold and all those things are coming to play too. So um these you know I guess I guess the issue is 
doing it with a thought of like, uh, I can't imagine just getting to that point and thinking like, how do I keep this just under 50%? But I understand the concern, but it's there for a reason. Like we were talking about with the structures that are, um, you know, built to withstand these storms, there's kind of a reason for some of these changes that have been made. So I think it's a tough process from like a personal standpoint versus, you know, having to deal with the 50% property that was really significantly damaging Ian and you're trying to just fix what's there um, and not I guess the building was put in place you know I don't know that it would withstand you know these storms or the place. so but that's what it is is it's mainly just having to make sure that your property has all those things in place so that's where that 50 percent comes in um and I think um I guess that's all there is about that and what else I was saying well, so one question I had, and pardon me if you said this before the intermission, I don't remember. Um, <laughs> but, but uh, when you're determining that 50% of value of the home, what value is used? Is it the market value? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, before, before you're starting the repair. So it would have been, for most people, they would have to go to you know, the county website, see what the value was. It's value now, it would be what was in existence. Okay. Not including the value of the game. Sorry, yeah. 50% of the value of the structure, not including the value. Okay. And so what about anything, like what are the traditional homes like? Swimming pool, uh, things like that, would those be counted as well or would those? No, it's just the actual structure itself. Just the structure, okay. Yeah. So uh, I know some people, my parents included, were told by the into the system so that the the amount and the value of the home can be reduced taxes that happened before or yes. Does that happen or after that fifty percent calculation? Would that play into it at all? Right. So we're going to talk about this today, actually, because we're trying to encourage people to take care for tax purposes. But it's different. The value before the storm for the fifty percent rule, but the sorry, after. Assessed value if, if approvals are you know, reducing your property um, under the circumstances being used against you for purposes of calculating 50%. Okay. I will say I know that the flood zones in Lee County are changing on November 17th. Um, so we had talked about, I don't, I honestly am not 100% sure how the 50% rule will be impacted by that. I would think it would be what was in place at the time of the storm. But let's say your property suddenly is in a new flood zone post November 17th. I would hope that they do not retro, you know, put that against you now that you're in a different flood zone. I would think it would be at the time of the storm because that was what was in place. That's the zone that you were dealing with. That was what your property was built in. But just I have noticed that, you know, they are changing those flood zones of November 17th. And I've seen people raise concerns about that. And I hope from a public policy standpoint, that would just like Bad decisions to do. Just out of curiosity, is that November 17th as a result of the storm or is that? No, they did those, they rewrote long privacy that they had planned that yeah. already and then they happened to go into effect right after the storm. So, you know, I mean. <laughs> um, but I do think it's going to be a sad situation because I think there's going to be people who are probably going to be in zone A after November 17th that may not have 
responded to the storm in a certain way because they were a different zone right. currently. So it's just a it's just a weird timing that thing. Is. It literally has nothing to do with the storm, but yeah, the timing of it is a little eerie. So. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we about it. So, they do not right now have any anything in the works that they've released or discussed. So, I just know Lee County, and like I said, it's been going on for some time. It's just been passed, and then it went into effect November seventeenth. So, I did actually go and check all year because I was curious if we're gonna have a similar situation. But they do not have anything right now. They actually there's the ones that they have in effect right now were like really recent, and I can't remember exactly because I like I said I looked at both. But theirs had just gone and they just updated theirs much more recently, where Lee County was very behind on that. And so Collier, I think years were behind. Now, touching on something that James talked about earlier, you talked about assigning your rights and assignments. So I know a lot of people have been contacted by contractors and you know other parties saying, hey, you know, we'll do this work for you, XYZ, if you just assign us your rights. Is that something people should be wary of or should they just jump right in? How would you handle that? Well, I think it's something to be educated on. I think that's that's important. So uh, in the news, there's been a lot of talk about assignment of benefits over the last couple of years. It's been the topic of some legislative reform, uh, a lot of which I think was good reform uh, by a legislator. Um, so when when you uh, submit an insurance claim, you can assign that claim to a third party. Right. So if you were going to sell your house tomorrow, it was just affected by the hurricane, you can call your insurance company to report a claim, you can sell your house and you could assign to the person that's buying your house an interest in the proceeds of whatever your insurance is spending right now. Um, if it was 3 a.m. and you have water all over your house and surf pros showed up at 3 a.m., can't get a hold of your insurance company until 9 a.m. when they open, surf pros is willing to get the water out of your house right then and there, you can assign to them a order. claim related to the dry out work and that serves the purpose of getting that water out of your house at 3 a.m. instead of waiting six hours until the insurance company comes out. So assign this to somebody else in the building and I don't want to be there and can assign my lease to somebody else potentially bringing a sublet, uh, sublet right? So that, that's what an assignment of benefits is. Now unfortunately in the property insurance arena assignment of benefits has been abused by some bad actors. Not all roofers are bad, not all dry out companies are bad. But some roofers and some dry out companies have taken it to the extreme. So they, um, you know, a lot of them using door to door type sales techniques, uh, go door to door. Uh, hey, look, you've got some damage to your roof or some damage to your property. If you just sign here, that will let us deal directly with your insurance company. We won't send you any bills and we'll deal, we will deal directly with, with your insurance company to be reimbursed for the work that we're going to do and what we will do in the future. And the problem is with a complete assignment of benefits, which is how most of these are written, uh, the homeowner, upon signing a document, gives up any and all rights to their insurance policy. Okay, if it's a complete assignment of benefits, the signing of that document now relinquishes any payment that will ever be made in connection with that loss to this contract. Okay, and if they're a great contractor and they do fantastic work and the prices are fair, and they're able to work amicably with the insurance adjuster to be reimbursed for the work they do, the assigned benefits works out great because as a homeowner, you don't have to deal with anything. Building owner, you get your property fixed and you don't have to deal with your insurance company. But what has happened, uh, particularly in recent years, is a lot of contractors are taking their pricing up too high. And so the insurance company won't agree to the pricing. They want $30,000 to do a $20,000 roof job. The insurance company says no. I'm only willing to pay 20. As a homeowner, if you did an assignment of benefits, you might have a long line of roofers willing to put the roof on for $20,000, but you can just sign your claim to this roofer, and he's not doing anything until he gets that insurance company to pay the 30 grand. And if they won't pay him 30 grand, then he's got some lawyer that makes a living working for assignment of benefits, AOB contractors, and that guy probably has 2,000 lawsuits pending right now, all seeking $30,000 on these $20,000 roof claims. And that's why you hear about oh, assignment of benefits. Kind of you know, attorneys are bad, and you know, it's tough for contractors and folks representing policyholders because there are some very bad actors 
doing a humongous volume of insurance plans in the state of Florida and taking the pricing to the extreme. So um, I don't think an assignment of benefits is always bad if it's limited to work that's actually being done, right? So if Surf is there at 3 a.m. and my assignment says this assignment is only limited to trial work that it's You know, Surfro did between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. on such and such day. Well, then that's fine. Um, Reapers, you know, the roof's on, and then they want you to sign the benefits. This is one thing, and it's limited just to the work that they actually perform. But the problem is the majority are written for work later to be done in the future. And too often we see the insurance company doesn't want to pay whatever pricing the assignment benefits contractor is asking for, and it creates a stalemate and it puts the homeowner in a position of not being able to fix their house because they don't even own the claim anymore. So what, a, what repairs would be made don't belong to the homeowner. So there's a huge yellow flag that should go up in everybody's mind anytime you're looking to do work at your house and the language of the agreement that you have with that contractor or um, restoration company, whoever it is, includes an assignment of benefits. Um, if you're thinking about signing an assignment of benefits, shoot us an email, we'll look at it. Take a look at it and see if it's something worth, you know, that, that is advantageous or not. Um, I wouldn't say that there's not any scenario that assignment benefits could be is 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 not good, but a lot of times it, the, what you're trying to get accomplished can be accomplished without an assignment of benefits. And so it's important to understand if you sign an assignment of benefits, you are giving up potentially your rights to the entire insurance claim to some contractor that you just met. And James, is that like an industry standard for a lot of like roofers, for example? Is that part of the market to sign some element of assignment of benefits or it, it be negotiated? Yeah, it became a big part of the industry over the last, I would say, the last five years. Um, there was a lot of legislative reform that basically the legislature came in and said, hey, if you're going to get an assignment of benefits, it's got to have all these different things in it. And so now we see more of it's what we call like a work authorization or a direction of pay. It's all the same thing. You're giving your claim to this third party vendor. And oftentimes they're not even doing work on site. Where I think it can be beneficial is in the context of trial. You know, because you need somebody to do that work. The insurance companies are super slow to pay these claims. I unfortunately know a lot of people that still haven't even received just the first payment for their insurance company. We're at day 40. So you're coming out of your pocket, you're coming out of your own savings. You know, if there's a contract that's willing to do dry out. It could be helpful if it's a good, reputable company, if their pricing is fair and reasonable, and if whatever you're signing says this is limited only to the work being done. So, you know, if I've got a roofer that's willing to put a tarp on there and then he wants a direction of pay or assignment, you know, should physically say this is only for the tarp. But that's not how 95% of the assignments that I see are written. Sure. Yeah, it's for drive, I should say. This is only for emergency services and mitigation work that's actually performed at the property. Um, and so there needs to be specificity. With respect to what's being assigned. There's a claims file on behalf of homeowners because I've seen lawsuits filed on behalf of homeowners or insurance company says, huh, I don't know you anything, you signed this assignment. We're, we're getting to go. Well, and the contract is back in Virginia now. <laughs> well, they said that you're, they, there's a very there's a sales pitch where they tell you, hey, sign this. We'll handle it. We'll deal with the insurance company. It's all off of you. You don't have to deal with it. No problem. But you do have to deal with it because, A, if the work can't be done for what they said, yeah. and you're stuck and you don't get all your work done, and then they're coming to you saying, you know, you owe me this. So also, and then also under your policy, you still have duties that you have to the insurance company. So if the insurance company wants to take your deposition, they want to take your examination under oath, they want documentation from you, you don't get to say, Hey, call the guy who I signed the AOB with. You still have a duty to do those things. So we've had people call and say, I don't understand why I'm part of this lawsuit, or I don't understand why I'm being asked for a deposition. You know, I signed over my whole claim. They're dealing with it. And that's, that's not how it works. It's still, you still have, it, you're still the insured. You're still the policy, the contractor. You just signed over your proceeds, not the whole policy. You can't sign over everything under the policy. So. So while we're on the topic of bad actors, especially in these coming days and you know in the 40 days that have preceded, people are going to be getting a lot of knocks on the door from insurance adjusters, from public adjusters, from attorneys. Can you kind of speak to who the different parties might be that will reach out to homeowners and you know what they should look for in each different party? 
Yeah, so always ask them to the answer. <laughs> um, I think we we you get insurance adjusters for sure. Um, they'll send someone to inspect first. That is the first person that usually comes out. It's an adjuster. Sometimes, like James mentioned, these adjusters are from other states or they've brought in people. For some reason, Texas seems to be a common one. I don't know why. I just it's a lot of Texas people. So a lot of times they don't, it's very unclear who this person is. And they say, oh, the insurance company sent me. Like, get a card, get you know their name, get their information. But yeah, so an insurance adjuster gets sent out. Um, on behalf of the insurance company, they'll do the initial inspection. Usually that person may also do an estimate of damages. They may not be able to do that. So there may be an estimator that comes from the insurance company who goes around, takes photographs, drafts up an estimate of what damages they see. The other thing that the insurance company may send out is an expert um, with regards to the roof or, um, and that will be possibly another individual um, that comes out, gets on the roof, figures out what the cause of the loss is. So that may be the three people that usually we see from the insurance company, I would say. As far as for individuals, you mean, they may see like a, the public adjusters that we talked about, roofing contractors um, that may come to the property. Attorneys cannot, so you won't see us knocking on your door. Um, that's not allowed by the Florida Bar. So if they are, that's, they shouldn't be there. But um, <laughs> I think those are the main people you would see with regards to the insurance claim itself. Yeah. Yeah, I think if the company is, is, is going from your company and it's not an adjuster being sent out, be very skeptical. Uh, because if somebody's been in this industry for any amount of time, business comes to them. Right? And so if somebody's out there out of payment 40 days after the hurricane or looking for work, probably not a state, probably trying to sell you something to me. I just I'd, I'd be skeptical <laughs> going door to door to generate business in a storm affected area like this. Very, very, very skeptical. One question, I think we're running out of time here, but one question I wanted to leave off on is, you know, given the storm warnings that we have coming in, is there anything post Ian that Floridians and especially people in the affected area should be looking for for purposes of this hurricane, this upcoming storm season? That they Anything you should be looking for? Well, I mean, I think, you know, in the immediate is trying to mitigate your damages, right? So there's an obligation under the policy, which, of course, you know, you feel obligated to the homeowner to protect the property, right? So we've got a lot of roofs that are damaged. It's, um, you know, very difficult to get a new roof right now based on materials and availability of contractors. We're still waiting on inspections by the insurance company or waiting on a check from the insurance company. So right now, I mean, the big thing is, in my opinion, it's harvest, right? Because we've got rainstorms coming and the damage is going to get worse. So uh, drying in these buildings with tarps is something that, you know, I think you're obligated under the policy to mitigate your damages. So you want to prevent additional damage. Obviously, you want to keep water at your home. And it's important that if there's coverage for a windstorm under the homeowner's insurance policy, there's reimbursement for mitigation expenses. Okay. So if, 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 the, if the storm is covered, if, the, if there's damage from windstorm, it's covered. There is coverage for mitigation expenses. Okay. So if your roof's damaged and you don't have a tarp on your roof, you're still waiting on checking your insurance company. There should be a tarp up there. And if you want, there's a whole bunch of companies in town doing tarps right now. Some of them are asking for a side of benefits. So uh, you know, look with caution. Uh, but there, I know several contractors in town that are doing a good job. Some of the service some of my, our clients, and then you know, there's there's good contractors in town that are doing the work and you know, have a tarp installed so you can protect your property from further damage. Because by law, quite by statute, uh, insurance company get 90 days. It's a long time, 90 days to complete their claims investigation. And I hope that a lot of insurance companies aren't going to take the full 90. But I am surprised at how many insurance companies have already taken 40. We're halfway there. So, you know, it's going to take some time. And then you get the check in the mail, you get to a mortgage company and pick out a roofer and that sort of thing. So, there's going to be a lot of rain in between now and the time you actually get a new roof on for a lot of folks. So, mitigate the damages by, you know, having a tarp installed, um, I think helps mitigate, you know, and gets through the, the short term problem of dealing with these upcoming, you know, rainstorms that will be happening this fall. Some of the delay that comes with a system that gives insurance companies three months to figure out what they're paying and do a checkout. All right, well, thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions for Five, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the first one is um, 
Is the one deductible mm -hmm. ever forgiven if the uh, structure is considered basically total total debt? Uh, that's a good question. I've already put some adjusters over this one. And the answer is um, it's a, for the total loss, okay, if the damage exceeds your coverage limits for the building, then the deductible is a wash. Because otherwise, you wouldn't be able to have a total loss. So if the building is insured for $200,000, you have a $5,000 deductible, okay? So if the, if, the, if the cost of repairs is $205,000 or better, then the deductible is a wash, right? So a total loss deductible does not get subtracted, you'd be entitled to the covered limits. And the total loss is determined what the coverage amount is? Yes, yes. Yeah, so a typical time. building call, you know, under a commercial building, if they have a couple of hotels, that'd be the limits for the building. Okay. And then under a homeowner's insurance policy, put fall under covered A, which you use you know, on the deck page, you'll say covered A dwelling. Okay. Uh, second question I know that under the one policy, pretty much everything that's in the house like the two by fours everything they are they are depreciated and then i want to go back to the roof when we talk about the 10 year and everything like that do they depreciate the roof so okay um let's make sure we understand what depreciation is right so um i think this is a room full of guys <laughs> okay here's a bunch of accounts right everybody knows depreciation right so okay so most policies uh, are on a replacement cost basis okay but the insurance company's obligation is, is limited to paying the actual cash value until the repairs are completed. And then the obligation is to pay the depreciation. So yes, your roof is depreciated, your contents are depreciated, everything in the dwelling is depreciated. But as long as it's an RCV policy, which a typical HO3 is based on RCV, not NCV, okay? As long as it's an RCV policy, then you're gonna be entitled to that withheld depreciation, but not until repairs are, are made. Okay. Um, my next one is having a separate room policy, which all of us on Santa Bell have. Um, is there anything that can possibly be submitted under the general policy post the end? Well, uh, the general policy might have coverage for, oh, well, okay, because you've got windstorm under that windstorm policy. Probably not. If you Issued in high risk policy, which probably like a wind X policy, uh, it, which is the areas we saw a lot down in the Keys after Hurricane Irma, and uh, it's going to exclude any loss related to windstorm. So it'll exclude like water from like wind. Yeah. So, an example I could think of is if there was if there was like an, an incident of vandalism, or you know, so there was a theft that occurred after the hurricane, power was out, island was vacant, that there's a theft loss or some sort of a fire loss or something that might fall. How about any possible that. follow? follow-up damage from the storm that's coming in, like the people that haven't totally got the roof's hard, would they be able to make a claim on a general policy? Because it wouldn't be a wind event. Well, it'll still be a wind event, right? It would be a, okay, all right, so let's back. So it would, it would still be a wind event, or if it's just rain, if it's just heavy rain on a on a roof and, and the rain's coming in, then it wouldn't be covered. So your typical homeowner's insurance policy has an exclusion. Been created for water that enters the building unless it's open. Okay, so roof that just yeah you know, just starts leaking. There's no windstorm, but just you know normal Tuesday and the roof starts leaking, and I can't tie it to a windstorm event, and that's not covered. That's a maintenance. That's a maintenance item, right? You know, I mean, people pay out of pocket all the time to replace the roof. It's not covered by insurance, so it's not tied to a windstorm. It's not covered under the homeowner's insurance policy. Okay. So now. If there's a bunch of rain that enters the building this weekend because it wasn't dry then, I still think that relates back to that hurricane heat analysis. Yeah. My last question is Are you aware of any um, possibly federally sponsored loan programs for people to use in two different scenarios? One uh, with the 50% build back rule, and the second one for commercial properties that are non compliant and because the building back will now be APA compliant. If you're are there any programs out there? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the first one that comes to mind is uh, SBA. Uh, I saw a lot of SBA loans issued to particularly businesses, but also to homeowners after Hurricane Irma. And so the SBA has lending opportunities available. The paperwork covers them for sure. Uh, the application process can be lengthy. 
uh, but the repayment for the repayment terms are friendly. The interest rates are friendly, especially in today's um, uh, lending environments. Uh, so that would be the first place I would look is is this SBA loans uh, because there's specific loans for disaster recovery. I have a question. Um, I have a structure behind the house uh, dock, and uh, I've been told uh, by my the adjuster that came out, oh no, that's going to be damaged uh, part, of the, uh, part, of the, part of the dock. Um, the upper structure is also damaged, and uh, so when I was saying, look, I mean, that was created by the hurricane. Um, so uh, he said, well, yeah, he said, I see your point. The upper structure, uh, you know, would definitely be uh, considered uh, on the uh, hurricane policy of the homeowner insurance. So uh, and I'm just trying to understand, um, you know, what the difference is and how to get away with that. And, uh, uh, it seems like they were kind of kicking the can back and forth uh, initially. I haven't been able to speak to anybody yet from the uh, flood insurance, so I don't know where I stand on that uh, particularly. Is, uh, uh, is, Way it worked out with the whole group things, so I probably didn't pay as much attention as I should have. But um, you got the insurance and the owner's own structures and so on on your homeowner insurance, and then they got flood. When you get the flood insurance, do you have to name the structures as well? So the, for, 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 that's just a good question. So for flood insurance, flood insurance only applies to the primary structure. It doesn't include the oh, yeah, structure. Really cool. Yeah, it doesn't include so the actual structure. The housing your docks going to be covered by NFIP. Maybe you have a private flood insurance policy. Yeah, no, I don't. But if it's NFIP, I don't think it's a footprint of the house, and maybe a pad for the air conditioning and whatever that is attached. Yeah. So then now we're looking at the windstorm policy, the HO3. Yeah. And so if it's nature three, then we've got to look and see what it says about docks. A lot of other structures. Okay. So so we've got to look at how that's defined in the policy and see if there's an exclusion for for docks. Um, I know seawalls. So I don't know where else it goes. And I know that seawalls are excluded. I see a lot of exclusion for docks, but I mean, I look at your look at policy and see what it says. Okay, so that's going to be back for the homeowners and the flood outside. So the flood is. Well, it's very federal, limited. It's federal program. I mean, it's they keep a federal it. program. It's just standardized across the country. It's not intended to restore you to your pre lost condition in the event of a flood. It's intended to pay for certain structural repairs to to be a step in the right direction to Flood policies are not intended to make it. I see. A typical homeowner's insurance policy has a tenant that they Now, if you're doing a lot of advocating, if you had coverage for a windstorm under, uh, you know, that included your dock, uh, you know, or boathouse, or whatever the roof structure is, there'd be a lot of advocating to say that, that was not flood, but rather, you know, wind. How do you decide what it's going to do? I mean, for us, 150 mile hour wind water from property, windstorm caused damage to that structure, and flood also caused damage to that structure. Okay. All right. Any other questions? All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I appreciate you guys. And, uh, yeah. Feel free, I'll, I'll give my cell phone number. If you get questions, text or call, I'll be happy to, to help you out. It's 727 207 5852. And of course, uh, you know, just, just let me know you're, you're at, the, at the seminar tonight. Of course, you can reach out through. Uh, through uh, their office as well, you know, through email or something like that, through invitation call. But uh, we really are here to help. Uh, what was the number again? Yes, 727 207 5852. Thank you so much. Water is not good.